If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke chapter number 8, Luke 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 41, Luke 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 41. The Bible says, and behold, there came a man of Je uh, Jairus, uh, excuse me, and behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him, saying uh, that he would come into his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, people thronged him. Now drop down to verse 49. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the uh, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed him, her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she rose, arose straightway, and, com and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should sh tell no man what was done. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the church here at Dover and how it's been a nurture to me down through the years. We give you praise for that. We pray, Lord, that uh, we would be faithful in the day that we live and that we would uh, see you magnified and lifted up this morning and we pray these things in the name of Jesus amen now uh, I'd like to preach this morning on the thought problem solved now uh, we like to get in situations and I, I say that because whether we admit it or not we kind of like the hummy drummy mood and we like to get in situations that we would describe as helpless. And really, if we could, we'd like to describe them hopeless. Now, uh, hopeless and helpless are two different things. Hopeless, you can't even imagine the problem being solved. Helpless is to say that the, the, the person or the thing or the remedy is not to you yet. You're helpless as you stand. But all the problems that the Lord's believers have are never like that. There, there's not one problem that is not solvable by the Almighty. Have you ever considered that and thought about it? Well, and, and you say, well, Brother Larry, I don't believe this because thus and so. Well, I will guarantee you the problem was solved. Now many people in this room have seen uh, people come and go at New Testament and some of them a little angry when maybe when they left and different things come and go. You know what that was? That was God helping us. It wasn't a problem. You see what I'm saying? Problem solved. Uh, we didn't need that for whatever the wisdom of God. And you know what? I've seen a lot of it fall out through the years just watching. I know we didn't need it. Now, problem solved. And, and sometimes it'll take you years to say, oh yeah, he did solve my problem. Now, I don't know about my, much about modern day math because I went to elementary school in the 70s and, and we just added things up. That was weird. We went down a line and we added the numbers and we carried the one and the two, right? Uh, they don't do it that way anymore, and they're, they're, they change a 33 to a third, all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, won't you just add the 33? 
and um, they give you some kind of answer. But you know what? I have to give them credit for. We come up with the same answer. Problem solved, right? <laughs> and so sometimes God will work in many, many different ways, and we see many different things that occur, but the end result is that the problem was solved. Now, what you're going to experience in this life, I have no idea. I really have no idea. You may think, well, I've done face the worst. Well, don't get that thought too deep in your thinker. You see what I'm saying? Because it may not be. I hope that it does work out that way for you. But uh, you really, really don't know. And, and so we find that we find uh, these individuals, Jairus and his wife, in a desperate situation. And that was with the severe illness of a child and the ultimate death of a child. Uh, I've never experienced that. Uh, I hope I never do. I'd rather die as a young man than see my children die. And I fully do mean that. And, and uh, so we see, we, we see, we can't really sympathize with these people. There's not a person in the in, under the sound of my voice this morning that I know of that is buried a child. Uh, uh, when Aaron uh, was run over by the mower. You know what? God spared his life. It was horrible. And, and now he had, you know, his hand is no longer there. But you know what? As horrible as that is, Aaron lived. Right? And so we see, we, we can kind of sympathize with Jairus, but we can't empathize with him. And there is a difference. To empathize with somebody, uh, to empathize, empathize with Jared, one of my children would have to lose a hand. You see what I'm saying? And, and I've not, not experienced that. I've not experienced the death of a child. But you know what? It had to be, and I'll have to say this, a desperate feeling. A feeling of what I described with no answers, right? With no hope. When nothing is there to solve the problem. And so he says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. Now, I want you to see <clears throat> that Jairus was a very stable man as far as we can look at it. He was a Levite. Uh, Jairus wouldn't have been a leader at the synagogue if he wasn't a Levite. Uh, that was reserved to them. And what came with being a Levite? A lifetime salary. They couldn't work at anything else. So the nation of Israel kept them going. You know, that, that's a pretty good job to me. Uh, I, I've not experienced anything like that as a nurse or as a pastor. Uh, either one. And, and, and so we see that that was a stable income for Jairus. But now this is the thing. It did not solve the problem. The first thing that's not going to solve problems, or let me say this, the first, time, the first thing you have to get out of the way to look onto Christ is solving it yourself. If you think you can solve it yourself, listen, you will never, ever look unto Christ. You will, ne you will never see him for who he was. But I want you to see that, that Jairus had, had exhausted all of that. He had, he had no doubt called for physicians, and no doubt they had responded to him, and no doubt they had given her herbs and medicine and everything they could think of. And now at the end of his rope, he finds himself at Jesus' feet. You know when people are saved, they find themselves at the end of their spiritual rope. Right? And he'll, until you have nothing less left, you will never call on Jesus. You know why people believe in baptismal regeneration? They think they have, they think they have another opportunity. They, they think they have another course of action. So they don't go to Jesus, they go to baptism. 
or good works or church membership or whatever you want to put in that blank. But we find that Jairus, he had literally come to the end of himself and found himself at Jesus' feet. Now, let me say one more thing about Jairus that the Bible doesn't say, and uh, I don't know, it, it never does. I studied it out. I don't know that if Jairus was a Levite, I mean, a, a Samaritan, I'll get out in a minute, if he believed in the resurrection or he did not. A Pharisee believed in it, a Sadducee did not. Now, if he was a Sadducee, what did this mean, especially to Jairus, that it was all over? You ever, ever thought about that? Just something that's all over, all done. Uh, I remember the morning mother died, and I was on my way to Erin. And I literally got to the end of uh, Bumper Smell Road, and Donna called me, and as soon as I saw it, I knew what it was. You know what I knew? I knew it was over. Now, thankfully, I know the truth, and I know the, the fleshly life was over, and I would to God, I don't know, and I, I talked to her many times, and I'll have to firmly say I ended up still not knowing the condition of my mother, but if she was saved, see, it wasn't over. In that sense, uh, I'm a Pharisee. I believe in the resurrection. You see what I'm saying? I believe that there is life after this one. I believe that, yes, indeed, we will be eternally with the Lord God or we'll be eternally separated from Him in a devil's hell one way or the other. So another discouraging fact or possibility, we'll put it that, another discouraging possibility, if he was, in fact, a Sadducee, this is it. His daughter is dead. There's nothing left to look forward to. She is gone. Her life is ended forevermore. What more sadness could that bring? What, what, what more problem could that be? And that's where, that's where we find them. Verse 42. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dime. Now, that's something that is a very real thing for healthcare people, and it's very hard to communicate. But you can see when there's no turning back. You, you, you can definitely see. Uh, uh, they used to tease me at work and call me, call, call me a prophet because I said she's got about 12 hours. And that would, be, that would be about the time that her life was. And she would be gone. Now, apparently, even in that day, the physician, Luke the physician, he, he was a true doctor. Still, even way back then, they knew when, life, when time was short. And the Bible says she lay a dying. You know what? Everyone under the sound of my voice, if Jesus does not return, one day you're going to lay a dime. And only one thing matters. Do you know Christ? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? The sum and total of this life here below is wound up into one simple question. Do you know Christ? And so we see that it appears at least that Jairus is very hopeless. Now, if you will, and in the, in the interim, and the reason I kind of skipped that is because I, 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 wanted, uh, I wanted to save a little time, believe it or not, for a change, is the, it, it is the miracle of the woman who was saved of an issue of blood. And, and so that, that delayed the progress, or at least in man's eyes, that delayed the progress of Jesus on his road to Jairus' house. But you, you remember this, if you don't get anything else out of this sermon, Jesus is a right on time. Every time, all the time, he's right on time. 
And you know what? Sometimes he may seem four days late to you, but you know what? He's right on time to give glory to himself. Always, always, always. And, and so we see um, this, this issue, uh, this healing, this interruption on his way to Jairus' house appeared to delay things. It, it appeared that it slowed everything down. And so we find uh, in verse 49, the Lord, uh, the Bible says, While he yet spake, there cometh uh, one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. Now here comes the most dreaded news for a parent, the most dreaded news that Jairus could have heard, what he was anticipating but hoping would not happen. Jairus, she's dead. She's gone. And then I want you to see, he said, the, the messenger always also said, trouble not the master. Now, uh, you know, when you, you see that word a lot in the New Testament, and you might think that they're giving glory unto Christ, but they are not. A master's, the way they're writing it, is like a master's degree. Like, uh, uh, some nurses have a master's degree in nursing. It's called an MSN, Master's of Science in Nursing. And uh, it, it, it has a significance in it, but uh, that's what th they were saying, Jesus, you're a smart man. Jesus, you're a good teacher. Jesus, you know a lot about the law. But you know, the mastership of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is why you can tell they didn't believe it. You know what a real master does? All things are under his feet. The wind, the rain, the light, the death, Everything is under Jesus' feet. Now that's a master. That's one you want on. Uh, that's one you want advocating for you. It's the master of all things, and that's exactly what he's about to illustrate to them. And they said, "There's no no, no hope. She's dead. It's time to bury her." It's time to let the Jewish funeral begin. Let's holler and let's wail. Let, let that part begin. Now, so that's where the... And, and one more thing I want to point out and we'll move on. This is the natural penalty of sin. Now, the, the girls, I think the girl, it says the girl there... Uh, uh, in another gospel, it may say that she was 12 years of age. I, I think that's correct. And uh, I think one place she's called Tabitha or Talitha, something like that. She's, a little more detail is given. And, uh, and so we, we find here, despite her age, she still paid the penalty. Now, that's always why I sometimes struggle with this age of accountability. And again, I know, I know, I don't know enough about it to even say. But I will say this, there's no magical number. I do know that. And this part I'll say, I don't know about people like Joey. I truly don't. You know why? <laughs> number one, not that I'm not concerned about people like that, but I do, I do all I do to be concerned about myself. You see what I'm saying? That's why the Bible says in James, make your calling and election sure. You be sure you have what you think you have. And you know what? That's a full-time full job for me. Amen. And, and, and so we see then that Despite whatever you believe concerning that, we do know this, that Talitha was under the penalty of sin because she died. And we, we do know that much concerning this, this, this girl. 
And so she's dead. Everybody's given up hope. Everybody, uh, everybody is, you know, discouraged, ready, ready to, <laughs> ready to have the funeral. Verse fifty. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, "Fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole." Now he gives them a three-part directive, and the first one is fear not. When, when, when you hear bad news, the devil immediately wants to push in that fear. Uh, oh me, oh no. Well, think of the worst, the worst possible scenario, and it's under his feet. What could be better? What could be, what could be more glorious than if it's the worst possible news there? Fear not. Now, why, why, why shouldn't we fear? Now, he's fixing to show them. But the reason we shouldn't fear is because, because it's under his will. It's under his control. You know, I think the biggest portion of God that we miss that he's omnipotent or all-powerful. That's what that word means. And if he is all-powerful, what's death? Right? Why is that devastating news? Was it not authored by God? Well, well, was it not part of what his plan was anyway? And, and, and so why, why be so discouraged? So he, he tells them immediately, don't you fear, fear not. Now again, why I believe that Jairus may have been a Sadducee, because see, if you, did, if you believe this was the end of all things, you would fear more, would you not? And uh, 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 Russellite people uh, call themselves uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and they are not the witness of the great God Jehovah. Uh, they believe when you die, you die, and you're done. Well, you know what? If I believe that, I pretty much live whatever way I wanted to, wouldn't you? That's the nature of the flesh, is it not? Yeah. And, uh, but we see, if we did believe something so foolish, wouldn't death be a little bit more devastating? I think it would be, don't you? That's it. They're done. Uh, nothing, nothing left to say. Nothing left to do. Totally in the end of it. That's right. That would be devastating. And I believe that's what Jairus and his, and his wife believed concerning this event. So it was particularly devastating to them. His next command, believe only. Do you believe that he does have authority over death? I do. I believe my days are numbered already. Right? And you know what? On top of believing my days are numbered, I'll put that confidence in him. He won't be a minute early and he won't be a minute late. All right? It, it, it will happen just when the Almighty has decreed it to happen and not a moment before. And, and, and so we see that, uh, that he recognizes that, that as well. Just believe. Believe Christ has the power. You know what? You think about lost people this morning, and you've been praying and praying and praying for them. Believe only. He still saves. Put your confidence in him. He still redeems. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. Together. One. Verse 51. And when he came into the house... He suffered no man to go in save Peter, James, and John. Now, this is not a boasting thing. It's a thing that, that uh, shows that you're committed to work harder. But if you lived in the days of Christ, would you not want to wanted to be like Peter, James, and John? See, they, did, they didn't get there <laughs> by... <laughs> By simply wanting to be. 
Now, we certainly know God is sovereign. He picked up all 12. The Bible says, have I not chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Right? He, he knew exactly who Judas was. And, and, and with that said, he picked those. But you know what the Bible says? That we are responsible for our own harvest and our own crowns. Remember he gives the parable, some, a sower went to sow, and some had 100 fold, some had, uh, some had 60, and some 30. And that's us. Another place he says, you shall have a crown of life. And so these men, they weren't just, they, it wasn't just simply, okay, this is going to be the inner three. They desired it. See, you know what's wrong with people today? They don't desire close fellowship with Christ. Remember John leaned his head over the Lord's breast and said, Lord, he said, ah. That's a close spot, is it not? In fact, the ones that was on the outside said, John, ask him. Ask him who it is. And he didn't say, tell me. I bet you it's Bartholomew, ain't it? Is it I? Am I the one that's doing it? That's why I say I have a full-time job taking care of Larry. Right? And, and, and so we, uh, we find then that uh, when, when we, we see these three men that we ought to have a desire because they're fixing to see something miraculous. And when they came into the house, he, meaning Christ, suffered no man to go in save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And they all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. Now, be careful with that, uh, because that's where the, your false doctrines, your Presbyterian and your Methodist and all that crowd get their soul sleep theology. Uh, that, that's not what it was meaning. Now, the way that mankind looks at it, she was dead. The other night, two nights last week, maybe it was a week before now, I, I lost so much sleep that week, I, I think it was a week before now, I went, uh, I went in twice to pronounce two people dead. And one of them, AJ probably could say, yeah, she's gone. <laughs> Cold. It's the coldest cold you'll ever touch. And you know what? My good old nurse's side said, looked at the, the primary nurse, and she been, I said, she's been dead a while. And I gave her the RN look, kind of looked over my glasses, you know, like check on your patients more frequently, uh, kind of look. And, uh, then the, the next day that I went, it was a little bit better situation. And the lady was still warm. And I put my hand on her chest. And I didn't feel anything. And I put my stethoscope on her heart. There was nothing there. And I said, yeah, she's, she's gone. You see what I'm saying? That's dead, is it not? Now, these cynical Jews, while we do certainly call them cynical, that's what they were seeing. This little girl's died. I've seen dead people before and she's gone. I, I know what death looks like. She's dead. See, they didn't believe Christ was Christ, did they? Because if they had believed Christ was Christ, the very God in the flesh, they would understand there's no dominion, that he's above all. Now, one thing we'll say, and then we're going to finish this up. She didn't ask to be resurrected, did she? She didn't invite Jesus if he, if he you know, 
I want to be resurrected now. Why not? Because she was dead. She did not have that ability, right? Uh, uh, I, I've seen lots of dead people, not seen any of them speak yet. I bet you if I did, it'd get my attention, right? And, and, and so we find his assessment of the situation was this. Because he was God in the flesh, he knew what he was going to do. Verse 53. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out. And I want you to see the cynics and the non-believers do not get to see this. And he, put them, and he put them all out and took her by the hand and said, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. And she arose straightway. And he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. Now, if you write in your Bible, underline where it says her parents were astonished. Because what had Christ said to them? Don't fear, but believe. And you know what? In this, in this feeble, pitiful flesh, I think they believed the best they could. Right? But when they saw their girl get up, she'd been dead. Who knows? Maybe an hour by now. We don't know how long she'd been dead. But she sat up, and the Bible says they were astonished. They, they were amazed. You know what? I'm still amazed and excited when I see people saved. Because, you know, really as a cynic, and, and I'm saying, oh, I preached a message. And, and, you know, in one sense it's true. It was at Northside Baptist Church several years ago. And, and, and it was on... Uh, 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 Ruth. And the Bible says concerning Ruth, she went out to glean. That means picking up the little pieces after the harvester has gone by. And maybe that's what my ministry is about. And I may just be gleaning, but every time I see one picked up, glory to God, I'm astonished. See, that's the difference between Armenian people and us. If you believe like they do, and, and we say this prayer, What's, a, what's astonishing about that? <laughs> Nothing, right? Anything but anybody can say the Humpty Dumpty rhyme, right? But when God intervenes, it's astonishing. It's amazing. It, it, it still makes me step back and say, glory to God. So we find then. Can Jesus bring life to death? He most certainly can. Now, I personally believe that he can still raise the dead if that's part of his, of his ministry. Now, before you think I'm getting Pentecostal on you, uh, I believe in the church age, what he's taught us, the apostolic age is over. You know, the Bible says the apostles raised the dead. Read the general statement concerning the apostles, and it says, uh, but see, the apostolic day has ended because there's no one that meets those qualifications anymore. No one living has seen Christ in the flesh, right? So they're no longer apostles. But you know what? If we had faith, the Bible says it's the grain of mustard seed. We can bequeath God and say, Lord, raise him up. But now the problem is this, <laughs> and I'm just being honest. If you be honest with me, you, you'll nod your head or say amen one. I know I don't have that faith. I know I don't. I've seen too many people die. I've carried too many caskets out. I've preached too many funerals. But oh, if I can get that type of belief, if I can get that type of faith, and how do you do it? Spend some time on Jesus' breast. That's how you get it. 